I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. I want to thank everybody for tuning in, using old radio terminology here. And uh, if you like the show, let us know. Click the like and subscribe. Click the share button. Share it with your friends. And if you want to support the program, you can do so. We've got a link to Patreon in the description. Um, so question number one, and this is a really good one. They're all excellent questions. I like this one. It says, my question is whether Sasquatch can recognize individual humans and distinguish between people, in particular for Will, who tracks his creatures. Have you ever thought that the Sasquatch you track so extensively have become aware of you personally and know that you follow them. If so, how did you reach that conclusion? And then this person goes on with some other stuff, but I'm, we'll answer this first. Well, it does appear that they do focus on individuals or not necessarily, well, they can focus, but they seem to know individuals. Um, I came to that conclusion partially after the occult investigation because they would react in specific ways to different individuals who lived in that farm and even to me and my team you know when when we were there they the responses would be one way and then and, and i don't remember all the details or there were lots of different circumstances but um it was it was pretty um predictable in other words you know they would respond one way when we were there when we weren't there, the family would say they would do different things. Uh, and, they, and they seemed to react different to the family members themselves, too. So, uh, and But in in uh, predictive patterns. So, uh, Forrest, how does that relate to what other primates do? Well, there's a particular instance that, I, that always comes to my mind where um, <clears throat> there was a female monkey that uh, she was in her last days of her life but she had been particularly attached to a uh, anthropologist um, that worked with her in her youth. And um, they had called him to let him, <clears throat> excuse me, let him know that she was in fact passing and that he might want to come see her. And she, as soon as she saw him, I mean, this big old smile spread across her face, and she was reaching out to hug him, and there was absolutely nothing in the way that you could deny that she had, she recognized him. She remembered him. There have been chimpanzees that Jane Goodall worked with as a young person, and her to come back as an aged woman, those chimpanzees recognized her. So... They have the same ability. I mean, I have I have horses that I have sold to people. Horses now, mind you. And they don't have the same intelligent level as a, any primate that I have sold to people. And I've gone over to, to see them years later. And they still recognize me. Uh, great hair and all. So, uh, you know, to say that an animal wouldn't... Uh, necessarily recognize you, uh, and and I think primates have a far greater ability to uh, recognize, categorize, and understand sometimes what you're doing versus other mammals. So yeah, I, I think I find that totally, totally uh, believable. Yes, that they would recognize you. You know, I, I remember when I was stationed at Fort Lewis, I would go visit my parents periodically, and my mom always told me. She said, "I always know when you're coming," because I never called. And, of course, this was, you know, 79 to 81, no cell phones or anything. So I would just drive out there. And she says, I always know when you're coming because your dog goes crazy when you're about a half a mile away. You could hear my pickup. And he would know that was me coming. <laughs> and he would run around and he'd do all these things until I got there. Yeah. Yeah. We, we don't give animals uh, much credit. 
that they deserve. I mean, they really do. Absolutely. They're a lot smarter than we think. Yeah. What's next, Tom? Okay, so going back to our same person. Okay, she says, do you think one individual like Diane Fossey could be come habituated to them at least to some extent? Any stories of Sasquatch seeming to target certain people or take revenge on certain people that may have annoyed them, maybe a hunter or somebody disturbing their territory? And then they just they comment that they recall a story about a Sasquatch who entered a man's house, beat him up. We know which one, what story that mm-hmm. was. Amazingly, he wasn't killed. Are there any other reports of that type of behavior? Actually, quite a few of those. Now, I know there are people out there who claim they habituate Sasquatch. You know, I'm, I, I'm not uh, involved in any of that stuff. I, I don't know, you know, what the veracity of those claims are, but... Um, as far as the negative ones, though, when they they seem to get annoyed at somebody for whatever reason, uh, there were plenty of stories like that. Uh, you could look in Teddy Roosevelt's 1892 book, Wilderness Hunter, and there's the story about Bowman and the two trappers who and all they simply did was enter the territory the creature came into the lean-to, got shot at, and then um, it resulted in one of the trappers being killed. So... That's one example, but there are plenty of those good examples in history. And we've heard um, a lot of reports that the creatures are very good at identifying specific individuals, people. They, they, they do recognize them. So, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, if, um, you know, if horse, horses can recognize her and, I, you know, there's there's these YouTube videos. Um, why did I get hit in the head with a can of beans? Right. <laughs> well, one of those that's you didn't leave the can opener out. Evidently <laughs> not. <laughs> no, but but that's a good point for us because it did go into your house. It went into your cabin, and it attacked you. So that seems to be the norm. If once they're in your house, it's it's bad juju. It's not a good thing. But there are cases too, like I wouldn't call it habituation, but when we did, and I've mentioned this many times, the occult investigation, it's what my book Haunted Valley is about. Um, we inadvertently set up boundaries with this group of creatures. And they fixated for reasons we never found out on that particular farm. They were in the valley, they were doing things in other locations, but they seemed to be fixated on that particular location. And, um, you know, if we didn't violate the boundary during the time of day, we wouldn't go out in their areas at night. They would come in there and vice versa. So, oh, sorry, I'm getting over the flu. So I might cough a little bit. I had to mute there for a second. But, um, yeah, I mean, they, they seemed to recognize what we were, we were there. They didn't know what we were doing. But they were on the verge of, you know, they kept, they kept seem, they seemed to keep moving in closer to us. And I, I think at some point they would have started showing themselves. They already did to the the family and the children that were there. When they lose that fear, that, I find that disturbing. Yes, it could have been. It could have turned that way. Absolutely. But I think it makes sense. I really. I believe that when you drive into the woods, if you've been into their territory and they've seen you, I think they know it's you long before you get there. I think they recognize the truck or the car or whatever. Or the sound. Person. Or, sure. Yeah, if you're going into an area repeatedly, they're going to pick up on that. And here's the thing. Again, Will, this is, goes back to what you said about uh, the dangers of trying to habituate these things, I, they are very unpredictable. Yeah, they're not some benign creature out there that's just going to react to you. They have, they're doing what they want to do. And if, it's in a, if whatever you're doing is in accordance with what they want, they might let you do it. They might just watch you. But if you're outside of what it is they want, you could have problems. And what is the term that you use so often that people try to 
attribute anthropomorphize human traits to these creatures yeah they try to they try to place human traits on non-human uh creatures it doesn't work with these things it doesn't really work with any creature okay what signs do bigfoot leave marking their territory and what can people look for to better recognize the signs i wonder if people are unwittingly missing these signs and wandering into areas that could easily uh, be avoided at times. And I think that is a rhetorical question, absolutely. <laughs> well, I, I used to wonder for a long time, for years, up until 1991, you know, if we if we were missing subtle signs, you know, because I, I used to think, okay, the creatures are here. I know they're here because I've seen them. So what do they do? Are they doing things that we would simply walk by thinking it was weather or whatever else being done to the surrounding uh, vegetation, you know, or rocks, things like that? So I talked about this one time before uh, about visiting Bob Titmus's house in Canada, and he showed me all these little broken sticks that he had. He had and he had a lot of them, and he said, you know, we were tracking this creature one, this one time when we found this periodically along the trail tracks you know as it would go by trees we'd find these and they were only about one one inch thick and they were broken over and he said they'd snap and then flip them over and i thought well you know in, in my mind it wasn't very impressive i thought well gee anything or anyone could do that until we were in um skamania county back in 1991 up on this ridge and or climbing up to this ridge and we found a Doug fir tree that was three inches thick and snapped over 90 degrees, eight feet off the ground. And it just, there was no other explanation I could think of. And then we found a line of these and I talked to my, my native buddies and they, one of them kind of chuckled and he says, Oh, you finally found that. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? Finally found that. And he says, well, that's, that's their mark. That's what they do. So, uh, I said, well, you know, it would have been nice to have known that ahead of time. And, and he chuckled again. He says, well, you need to find some of this stuff on your own. <laughs> but Yeah, but it, it is nice to get that uh, yeah. confirmation. And, but once you, once you see it and know what it is, and you can't just go out and yes. say, well, any tree you find broken over is Bigfoot. It's not. It's not that. You don't find it that often. But when you do know what it is, it stands out like a sore thumb. It does. And I've been with people that every tree break they see, it's these things. And, you know, I just try to be polite. And I showed you uh, in September how to identify those. Right. And there was a location back in 2019 where I actually was told they're up there by a Forest Service ranger of all people. And you go up there and I found six of them. And I would mark them with a GPS and then mm -hmm. take a compass reading and then you go back and check the uh, topo map later, and you'd plot where there was, they all pointed to each other. They're all about 100, 110 yards apart, roughly, but they formed a line. You Just like that old, you know, as a little kid, you had those connect the dots. That's right. exactly what it was. And, and that's what Lisa found, and it's what I found. And, and my buddies told me from, from the Klamath Reservation, they said, yes, that's, uh, that's the big, he said, that's the big guy telling the rest of them, that's where we're going to the next feeding area. That's what he told me. And, yeah. right? Don't be in the feeding area, right, Will? You don't want to be, you don't want to be in the feeding area. It's like getting in the bread box. You don't want to be there when somebody's hungry, so. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, they're there at nighttime. We know that. Typically, okay. Yes. Yes. And they don't always sound like Bigfoot. They sound like owls. Among other Coyotes. things. Okay. I, any idea if Sasquatch travel more in the winter or summer? It would seem they were moving a lot in snow. I should let me rephrase that. It would seem if they were moving a lot in snow, this would make for easier tracking. So, do you think there's any variation in how much distance they move? during the seasons uh probably because um well and that person's correct you would see more sign of it in the winter in the snow but you don't you'll see them come down from the high country periodically 
and then but they go back up whereas in the warmer seasons they seem to move uh from area to area more often well in the areas well that you and i have worked in you know the cascades wintertime snow eight feet it's harder going <laughs> we're sure. not up there yeah so if yeah, you're making bigfoot tracks nobody knows yeah typically you're going to find when you find prints in the winter it's going to be right around the snow line because that's that's the transition where they're going from one elevation to another they're not necessarily going from area to area they're, go, they're going in changes in elevation well what about um what about the game does the game move down in winter time or does it go to the higher elevation? you know i think a lot of times a lot of times they go up and again that's that goes back to that anthropomorphized thinking you know don't place human values on a non-human species because what we would or wouldn't do isn't what a wild animal is going to do okay two questions for the q a uh first one here is any reports on bigfoot climbing abilities i mean climbing steep rock click face cliff faces uh since you know since we're found in mountain regions and going over mountains i've wondered if they've ever been observed climbing rocks rock faces that sort of thing well the short answer is yes and i'll give you one example just for the for the discussion um i talked to there used to be a couple ladies older ladies who ran the the uh, willow creek museum in willow creek california and I was there, and it's changed since then. They have, you have to go make an appointment to go see the museum now. But these people used to work there, you know, volunteer, I think it was, pretty much all the time. So I used to stop by there when I was in that region, and I talked to them. And, and one of the ladies told me there was um, a recent account. There were a couple of guys who were in the Marine Corps who were driving through the area, and they watched one go up this really steep rock, uh, rocky, it wasn't a cliff, it's... I, it's really just hard to describe that area because it's it's very rugged. But this was a very rocky, very steep slope. And the creature had a deer in one hand and was climbing like crazy going up. It was just apparently the one hand. So, yeah, they seem to be very adept at that. Well, and the guy and did, and that I was can... Buddy Fight? No, no, no. This was These are oh. two, two Marine Corps personnel. Who were oh, on leave okay. or whatever driving through the area. Uh, go ahead, Forrest. Oh, I was just going to say that from what I have understood, <clears throat> and I've never never uh, actually seen a track uh, other than what we had out here, and I really couldn't distinguish the mid torso break in the, the, the track that we had out here, but uh, um, that the ones that I have seen and the ones that uh, Melbourne has got quite a few. Um, with exhibiting the mid torsal break, even though they have an inline toe like we do, um, that would exhibit to me, indicate to me that they exhibit a ability to uh, move their feet to grasp, and they also have uh, what I've un- <clears throat> what I've understood from people that have seen their hands that they the hands and the thumb turn in which is a primate thing, not a human thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, their flanges are longer, too, uh, it appears, than ours are. So that would indicate to me that they have a great ability to uh, do a lot of climbing, whether it be in trees, up rock face cliffs, or or, uh, they could probably pretty much go anywhere they desire. Yeah, they seem to prefer... from your yeah, we have a static foot. We can't do that, you yeah. know. We have hands, of course, that can, but and can grasp. But uh, we're not really designed to do uh, climbing. We're designed to do walking and running. Yeah, from a lot of the reports I get, um, and things I've seen in the field, they they seem to prefer the worst locations. It's not not places a, a human would be, um, you know, easily to pursue them on. Yeah, they seem to prefer these really steep, really nasty locations. Uh, and that's probably a defensive measure, you know, to keep any kind of predator from following them. You'd think we get the idea, huh? You would think. Yeah, it's not It's not an easy <laughs> walk in the park going out looking for Bigfoot. You have to look at the worst places. Where are we at, Tom? All right. 
So it's been stated on the show that Bigfoot usually have a range of about 100 square miles or 100 miles at most. I think 2,500 square miles was stated, which would be a 50 square region. I think it's more than that. But wouldn't you expect there to be some regional adaptation to different conditions over time, which would result in markedly different animals? Of course. I'm thinking about Patty uh, well, living in the Oregon Rockies, and actually I'd say, well, Oregon Cascades, Oregon Cascades, versus the Arizona scry grub. Well, I'll give um, you I'll give you the examples that was told to me just directly, um, and it goes back to the last question as well. Um, you know, because we talked about them climbing and stuff like that. There's certain different variations, right? There's 22 variations of the creatures, and if you look at what's in the Patty film. That's designed for mountainous terrain. It's very bulky, very muscular. You can tell it would do very well in mountainous terrain. If you go east of the mountains, Cascades, Sierras, etc., you get flat country. Witnesses report seeing creatures in those regions as being, they're tall but much thinner. And that's an adaptation for open country running. So they don't have the bulk that the ones west of them do. And then so on as you go east, you get different adaptations. Yeah. Um, could there be distinct populations, not only physically, but perhaps in terms of temperament or behavioral habits? Uh, probably. What do you think, Forrest? Oh, I would think so, yes. You know, it's just like your uh, uh, chimpanzees. I mean, the varieties of chimpanzees, the bonobos, the uh, your standard chimpanzee, and then your uh, billy apes. Uh, there's, they all exhibit different types of, uh, of uh, personalities and uh, that are exclusive to those groups. And I would think the alpha of a particular group would exert, you know, some of that behavioral uh, stuff on the group also. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the more aggressive the, the alpha, then the more aggressive the, the group. And I think I sent you that... Uh, uh, article that they had out about uh, some chimpanzees that they had rescued from lab situations and actually had returned them into uh, an African um, situation and habitat and they had gotten out of, uh, or some of them had, had gotten out of this and then they attacked some visitors and uh, if you remember that, the, the guy, the, the head alpha male was Bruno, I think was the, ter- yeah. the name the head gave him. Right. And uh, he, uh, most of the chimpanzees, because they had been, uh, had they been uh, raised in lab situations and they were used to humans, they went back into the, uh, the, the enclosure. However, Bruno, after he had attacked and... Uh, really injured two of these people uh then all, all they did just to come out there and to see them um he'd injured them very badly and um he took off with a group of them and they actually are now living in the wild they've never been able to recapture them and they have started all of them have uh been reported to be uh pretty aggressive and they uh, they didn't start out that way but they became that way they acquired the temperament of the the group leader Bruno. Yeah, very interesting. And and we see that with different areas with the creatures, different reports. You know that for everything from, you know, them seemingly being offstandish. Uh, of course, they don't really know what's going on with the whole context of a situation. But you know, ramping up to being very aggressive in certain other places. Well, humans haven't been too kind to uh, any of. Uh, uh, the primates, so uh, it, it's almost understandable sometimes why they react the way they do to us. Right, right. What do we got next, Tom? Okay, so this is this question is for Forrest. Hi, could the creatures where Forrest live, or excuse me, let me rephrase this. Hi, could the cre- creatures where Forrest is have human-like teeth because they don't bother her animals just the animals food this person says i'm in mississippi so two weeks ago a teen told me that cats are missing from the rural area where she lives i did find cats 
heads only. Also, one night when brother arrived home from work, he saw some hairy person, I'm, I'm assuming, run across the yard. I didn't give her any idea to frighten her. What do you think? Um, this is from Jackie. Jackie loves the shows, and I'm just going to comment. Um, well, we've seen in these little towns that are very, very small population, you know, maybe 1,500 or less, uh, an inordinate amount of missing livestock, missing domestic pets, and missing people posters on the bulletin boards. Yeah, well, it's, you know, those animals, people's pets and pet food, things like that, livestock, livestock food, are easy targets. I mean, that's, uh, that's something they don't have to work very hard to get. So, sure, that would be a target as opposed to being out working to hunt. And it is a little disturbing to find just the heads. I guess the question I would have is if, if they were to go back and examine those heads, uh, if they've been severed, you know, by uh, some sort of tool, then mm-hmm. that's something you need to report to the authorities. But if it's been dismembered without the use of tools, you know, like this popped off, then mm-hmm. I think that pretty well points the finger here. I've heard this periodically over the years and, and really don't know what to think about it because um, most cases you find the entire animal gone. So I, I really don't know. Could be a particular behavior it could be done for a reason we don't know yeah and here's the other thing even if it is if it is the creatures and they're popping the head off um how long would that last i mean if you if you discover just the cat's heads then that would indicate it's pretty recent activity whatever it is whether it's the creature or whether it's uh some very foul people right yeah and typically with a sasquatch they don't really distinguish you know what they're eating on an animal they eat pretty much everything so i don't know why they would leave the head if they're going to catch something the size of a cat they'd probably eat it all yeah i just want to say it's very disturbing so what was that forest i think coyotes are the same way too they'll they'll eat everything they consume everything right but she asked if i thought that the dentition would be more like humans. Uh, I do believe that uh, they do say that some have the blocky teeth and uh, the less pronounced canines like what we have. Um, but uh, you do have in some regions where, uh, and I think it's in the deep south, isn't it? Well, you might correct me here. I think you might be more familiar with that, that uh, in the deep south, that there are some that have the very large canines, very right. pronounced. Yeah, throughout, and, uh, throughout the south, typically that's what we find. Yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't see any teeth. Nobody grinned at me or showed me any teeth. But, <laughs> which uh, is a good thing. Uh, which was a good thing. I, that uh, the, the grinning does not make me happy. We don't need uh, a lip flip. <laughs> that, that means an entirely different. That does not mean something good is going to happen when a, a primate uh, does that to you. So no, that's a uh, anyway, <laughs> um, but. Um, it's not the same as us smiling, so don't ever smile at a Bigfoot if you have any. <laughs> no, don't. No <laughs> grinning. <laughs> uh, no showing the teeth. But anyway, I, I would think that uh, what the indication to me was that they were far more, uh, uh, they liked the the horse feet a lot more than they uh, did my cats, and I would just soon keep it that way. I mean, I can stand losing a bag of horse feet or uh you know, but then what I'm kind of concerned about now is the fact that we've got everything locked up, chained up, and even changed the lock on the the cat house that when well, we had cat feed, uh, cat food disappearing. Uh, that um, am I going to start having problems with uh, cats disappearing? So um, I am very very cognizant of that fact, and every night I go out there and uh, um, and make sure that they're secured and i do have some cats that live in the barn that i that they're feral i can't get them put up but they i tell you what they stay in the barn and um then i have uh, about five cats that stay up here at the house and they don't ever go, come in or go into the the my my cat house so um they stay i mean they're right here at the house and they can go under the house if they need to. So 
You know, but I, I, was thinking, I mean, I do a head count. I do a head count all the time. Oh, yeah. I was thinking, too, about your area. Since you locked everything up, they haven't really changed their behavior a whole bunch. In other words, they haven't gotten more violent. Um, no, Tom. They, I'm thinking they must be getting what they want or need from other other homes in the area, which well, is why they haven't. Well, that are, I mean, they, we, have a, <clears throat> we have the largest, they call us the whitetail deer capital of the world here in, in Atlanta and Burnett uh, counties. We have probably... Uh, the largest population of white-tailed deer to be found anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you this, that the times that I have gone outside at night with my spotlight, I do it periodically, Uh, not because I just like to wander around in the dark, but just to kind of see what's going on. Um, And I have noticed that there are a lot of deer coming up uh, in my pasture that I had not ever... I mean, not to say that I've had not had deer in the pasture before, because I have, but I mean, there just seemed to be an inordinate amount of them out there. Uh, so something is pressuring them to come in close. That's an interesting so, development, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I thought that too. And um, so well, I don't since... think I, I don't, I had mentioned that to you guys, but no. I, I, we were talking about it just the other night that I was seeing a lot of uh, signs of deer out here. Coming in. I would say, too, since, you know, the, the stuff in your barn, the feed, is was probably kind of like a bonus. If they've got a lot of deer and other animals to eat, that was probably just something that was easy to do, but not, apparently not that big a deal to them if it's locked up, because there's still plenty of other yeah. food sources. I would Yeah, say they if, haven't tried to bust into anything. Yeah, if the food sources were more limited, then I would expect a little more violent reaction to that. Well, I, I worry about my foals, too, out here. I mean, because yep. the foal is just about the same size as a, a deer. And I luckily, I have never had, I've never had anything attempt to, uh, to kill them. Well, that's good. Hopefully that stays that way. Yeah. Maybe they don't want, uh, <laughs> they don't want my vengeful side coming out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tom, let's move on. All right. So Haley wants to know, hello, I have some questions about Bigfoot reproduction. Has a Bigfoot, has a pregnant big, Bigfoot ever been observed? And what about breastfeeding? By comparing them to apes, what would you expect the reproductive cycle be in terms of length of gestation, how long breastfeeding, how long till maturity? Do you think females move between, move between tribes as they mature are they abducted, given away, left on their own? In humans, for example, most of the time females, uh, you know, they marry and males tend to remain part of the family groups. Do you think there's one breeding pair in a tribe, like with wolves, for example, or many breeding females at any given time? I think that's a question for you, Forrest. You can probably answer that because I, I don't really know. <clears throat> well, uh, and and you know what? I don't really know either. It would have to be completely surmised, uh, uh, an assumption on my part, uh, it, based on what other primates do. Usually in uh, primate societies, you'll have uh, the what I call beta males. Uh, sometimes they'll hang around on the uh, outskirts of the group. Uh, to see what they can, if they can get lucky and breed with a female, if she'll, you know, uh, uh, present herself to them, uh, if they get lucky. Um, but most often they will move off and, and form bachelor bands. And then uh, you have females that will, daughters don't usually, they will stay with their mother for a, a period of time. But when they become breeding age, they will move off because um, unless, unless you have a situation where their father as the alpha male may have been replaced, then you'll see them stay. Uh, animals have seem to have this innate sense of knowing how to prevent, prevent incest. And they probably understand uh, to a certain degree and not in the cognitive sense that we understand it, that, that is not a good thing. And um, 
not for in the, the moral sense, what I'm speaking of, I'm talking about in the biological sense. So they have, they have these abilities to understand that uh, if daddy is the, still ruling the, the roost, you need to go someplace else because uh, you don't want daddy fathering your children. Um, so I think that they do that and they may join up with these uh, bachelor bands for a while. They may go off to an entirely different group, which they've been known to do that too. So <clears throat> it, it all, it, it varies. Now, as far as the breastfeeding um, females, it's different. It's different with all sorts of females. Um, they will, some will feed those babies for upwards or even let them nurse upwards to uh, a year and sometimes even let the older ones, uh, uh, when they're 18 months old, almost two years old, come over and nurse off of them. But I have noticed that when they're pregnant, that's when they, uh, they start, you know, the older ones, they, they shun them. They don't want them nursing because, first off, you don't want that colostrum going off. To, uh, you want that uh, given to the newborn. You don't want it to, uh, you know, some 18-month-old nursing on you and hanging on you and getting the colostrum that that newborn needs to have. So um, it's usually a two-year cycle. And, and, and again, this does vary. It just depends on the female. If the, the baby is real independent and has gone off on its own and is foraging and everything else, then that female may come into estrus. It, it just varies, and it varies within groups themselves and sometimes and it definitely varies within different species so uh there is absolutely i've never seen it set down in stone as to uh you know exactly how long that that happens but i have seen mother mccox that uh, she will have a a newborn on her breast and then after that that baby's maybe uh you know a month old or two uh two then you'll have sometimes the older one that's feeling a little jealous and needs a little comfort from mom. And she'll actually bring that uh, 18 month old over and let her nurse or him it nurse for a while. And uh, it kind of gets the satisfaction of knowing that, well, I'm still loved, you know, mom still likes me. And, um, but it, they don't make a habit of it, you know, and most of them, most of them wean them. And, and if you've watched some of them, it's not, when they wean them, it's not real pleasant. They bite and they very throw them around and everything else. So when they're weaned, most of those kids know I've been weaned. <laughs> you know. You know, it's interesting. We talked about the group dynamics. <clears throat> I can e offer an example in you know, the Skamania, Clark County areas of Washington back, you know, in the '90s, when I was working that area for a dozen years, and the groups that were in those areas, there were two groups that we knew that had males and females and young. And there was also another group kind of in between those two. Now, we're talking about a range that was over 3,300 square miles. So one group would occupy the western part of that area. The other one was far to the east. But there was a group of just males in between those two. And I do know that periodically yeah. one of those would, would bond with one of the other groups, and they would go back to the separate males. And we knew they were males because they were seen, and we could identify where the group was and how many members by their footprints. Yeah, and those bachelors are always looking and watching for the weaknesses in the alphas. And um, uh, there have been cases where a, a group of uh, males will go in and actually take over a band of, uh, you know, and, and oust the uh, alpha. Yeah. And then take over a band and... What ends up happening is the the head guy will be the the alpha. He'll become the alpha, the most aggressive and the biggest will become the alpha. And then all those other guys are just kind of like the beta males that hang around on the outskirts. And <clears throat> if they get lucky with a female, that's fine. If they don't get caught, they don't. They sure as heck don't want to get caught because the penalty is not very nice. You know, um, it was I mean, they can they can get vicious. Oh, about yeah. it. it was interesting but, with these groups but if he gets into a confrontation then those betas are always going to be there to back him up yeah it was interesting with these groups the the one group was the one that was in yakult there were there was a male a female and two juveniles 
and the male wasn't particularly big. In fact, well, the female had 16-inch prints, and the male would have been close to, I think it was 15, 15 and a half inch tracks. But of the, the, the group that was all male, there were two of them that were 10-footers. I saw one of them, and, and those were really, really big creatures. So they would easily be able to come in and dominate a group like this particular one. Hmm. But they seem... Well, I've seen I've seen females will defend. I mean, if they've got a troop and if they like their male, yeah. they'll defend them too. And, yeah. And that could have been could have been the case in that situation. The group east, I don't know. We didn't really work that area that much when I I moved away from that area. I was just starting to to get into that area, but I, I didn't really work it very much. So I don't really know what the makeup yeah. of that group was. Well, and there's a lot of dynamics that people don't consider, and and it, it's somewhat like humans. You know, the females may like the male, so they will defend, help him defend the troop. But they also they, when you've got a big aggressive male, you will see when he walks by with his tail, they they strut around with their tail. I don't care what male it is, whether it's a long tail macaque or. Uh, a pigtail or whatever they stick their uh their tail straight up in the air and um you know monkeys just they don't have any tails uh, you know your apes don't have any tails but they'll strut around you know and you can see i'm the big macho guy you know just the whole attitude but the females will if if he is extremely gr- aggressive male you'll see them grabbing their, fe- their their babies and clutching them close to them you know and all the the yearlings two-year-olds they run for run for cover they don't want to do anything to antagonize that male uh so some females can appreciate the fact that this uh big dominant male is going to defend them but in you also have some cases where you absolutely see fear you know so it's a whole range of dynamics within these groups you know i wonder too you said something about how the beta males will be kind of on the edge of a group waiting for opportunities. Mm-hmm. I kind of wonder if with these guys, if more often than not, those are the ones who act as the sentries as well because they seem to be on the outside edge of where the group is operating. Oh, that would be, yeah, I would think that would probably uh, work, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would think you'd make points with the group if you were the one, you know, identifying a threat Letting and a warning know. the group and, <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, letting them know trouble's coming. Right, yeah. right. Tom, what do we have next? Okay. Dean wants to know, Dean has some questions about your research uh, and tracking Bigfoot. Okay, so when you guys got in track and research Sasquatch, what precautions do you take? Do you always carry a rifle, tracking phone, always go with the least, at least one other person? Now we go out by ourselves in the middle of the night. Um, the sarcasm. All right. Well, the first um, the first but, thing that's important you do is you have to research the area. You gotta know the history. Is there a history of activity in the area and what are what are the behavioral profiles of those encounters? In other words, were they were they violent, were they nonviolent? Uh, what was figure out what the creatures were doing in the area. Look at the patterns. Well the other the, oh, the rest of the question is, he says, do you always have a good video camera with you? And have have you or anyone tried tracking them during winter when they could leave more visible tracks? Or is that too difficult, if not effective? How come Sasquatch have been so elusive getting on camera? Do you know of anyone who's had success okay, getting good video? And There's a whole bunch I'm of questions gonna, there. So we, we kind of need to take them one at a time. One at a time. Okay. So, do we carry weapons? Sometimes. Yeah. It, it depends on the, um, on the circumstances. Some places right? you're not you're not allowed to bring weapons in. Uh, some places it's just not necessary. Okay. Always go with a group. Minimum the of more, four. The better. Minimum of four. That's my standard rule has been for many years. Yeah. And they say, why? Good video camera. Wait, let me back up a minute. Why four? Because four people, you can watch all four directions around you if necessary. And it's a little bit well, larger group. It's it's kind of a numbers game with these things. The more people, the more intimidated they are. Yes. 
Um, and I'm just going to throw out whether, let's say you're not doing Bigfoot, you're just out hiking around. Knowles, a mm-hmm. National Outdoor Leadership School, recommends for people. That way, if one person gets injured, one person stays with the injured person. Not one, but two people go and look for help. I'll tell you what, I'll use a a quick example here. (laughs) When I was in the Army and stationed in Europe, I went to the the first level leadership academy, you know, to become a sergeant. And during one of the exercises, it's middle of winter, we were in bomb holder, uh, which is a really miserable place back in those times. And our squad was out at night and we had one person get um, frostbite and he couldn't walk. And carrying a, a human out is much more difficult than you might think it is. You see all these things on TV, and it is not that easy. Uh, we, we made a stretcher with our ponchos and a couple of, uh, of branches that were large enough to do this with. And I think it took it took at least six of us to carry this guy out. So you need more people in case, like you said, in case somebody gets injured. If you got to carry him out, one other person isn't going to do it. Yeah. Well, in the army, they have a saying: "One is none, two is one." Right? Yeah, you always, you always need more bodies. Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, as far as the camera, will we have laughed and we have talked about the cameras? <laughs> well, I've always carried a, a number, and something Renee De Hinden taught me was always to carry at least two cameras, um, for obvious reasons. If something goes wrong, but. Um, you know, with one, and I, I've been out with many, many people who brought their camera, really expensive one. Sometimes my friend Carlo used to bring a, a really expensive Nikon with him, and it always seemed like that camera was having issues. So I was able to get pictures all the time because I had at least one camera that was in working order. Uh, I don't recall too often having malfunctions with either of them, but um, I, I was, you know, more. On top of that, because, you know, DeHinden used to say, hey, you, this is something that's really important. You need to be really good with this and, and pay attention to make sure your stuff is in working order all the time and, and think ahead of yourself what you what you might want to take in the way of pictures. So um, I always carry two. I have a thermal now um, and some other equipment. So, Well, and uh, doesn't that make sense? I mean, it's, it's not just cameras, but all your equipment. You want to do an inspection one or two days before you go in the field, Always. you want to be prepared. Yeah, because and if you're in the middle of nowhere, you, you a lot of times, here's something, folks, if you, if you find evidence, a lot of times it's a one-time thing. Once in your life, you're going to find that particular item or, or evidence. And if you're not prepared, and, and a lot of times it's bothersome to carry a lot of stuff with you, but, you know, that, that one set of pictures or however, whatever collection method you're using might be the only time you get that. And if you don't have the stuff, you could be kicking yourself the rest of your life. Yeah, no kidding. Well, and going back to the cameras, nowadays we have the GoPros. Now, the only problem I've run into those is, uh, you know, the length of the battery life. I typically get about 30 minutes, 38 minutes Mm -hmm. in some cases. But you can extend that with, uh, you know, you can modify the case that they're on and, and put a uh, external battery pack on. Right. But the GoPros, you can, you know, if you want, you can helmet mount them, and you could have four of them. Right. I'm still so you a little. Got a 360 I'm still a little old fashioned. I, I like my Canon 35 millimeter. It's digital, but uh, and I, and you want to set them on the highest resolution. I do the same thing with my cell phone. So if I take pictures, yeah, it eats up a lot of space. But again. If you're going to take pictures of something, um, you want the highest resolution always. And maximum frame rate. Absolutely. Yeah, that's. there's nothing more frustrating than seeing a video where the frame rate was too low. And, and when you go back, it's just this real kind of steppy, jumpy. I think that's why we get a lot of stuff out there that people don't buy is because it, it looks so bad. Yeah. And I've heard, I haven't seen it, but I've heard that the, uh, or I, I, sh- I shouldn't say, I don't own one. The new iPhone 12 seems to have pretty good uh, camera capabilities. Yeah, I, I have an 11. It seems to do pretty well. Yeah. But so, I, but my phone, I, if I've got my cameras in my hand, the phone gets forgotten. So. 
Well, and I think a camera gathers more light, and it's just it makes sense. It's a it's a in in a lot of ways, as far as the quality of the image, it's the preferred tool. But yeah, it's, it's better. big and bulky, so yeah. Um, so anyway, I get. I think we answered the questions regarding that. Okay. Good questions. Very good questions. Yeah, very good. And those are the same questions or the same issues that we deal with when we're in the when we're out. And it's and it's never one fix for things because things change over time, and especially different circumstances you get into. And um, it's taken me a long time to really. Um, get the right equipment that I wanted and you know again technology changes over time so you like I just got a, a thermal camera so and it's not a top of the line one but it'll be good enough for what I want to use it for so but it's not something if you're going to jump into Bigfoot research it's not something you're going to go out and spend a you know hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars on you know I like I put in my book Bigfoot research or Bigfoot fieldwork 101 if you want to get involved start with some cheap things see if it's something you want to do and if it is then you can step up your equipment if you want to but i wouldn't recommend spending a lot of money initially and, and for the casual person you've got a cell phone and most are pretty good these days so you know that's your camera your recording device you know make notes um and uh yeah that's huge yeah it is it is huge and be thorough you know, if you find something do a good search around the area because you're going to find more things Yep. Yes, absolutely. If they're there, they leave, uh, you know, they're going to leave footprints, they're going to leave other evidence that they're in the area. Right. Taking notes, taking notes. I just have one of these little small, probably four by three and a half inch waterproof note. You know, it's just the little notebook that's waterproof paper and you can write out with a pencil. And if it's pouring down rain, it still works. And notes, notes, notes. Or, or, you know, take a recorder and, and talk into it. Then you can transcribe your notes later. But Okay. Yeah. Where are we at on questions? Okay. So do you have an idea what percentage of Bigfoot calories come from meat versus plant material? And do you think they're primarily carnivores with some plants during appropriate seasons or more like a bear, which is primarily vegetarian with opportunistic hunting of meat and then there's some other stuff but i'll throw that in as well for us like for us can comment on this too but i i would i would say the sasquatch is primarily a protein eater in other words meat because they have large brains and it takes a lot of protein to run that tool just like us uh they supplement their diet with plant materials and other stuff now that means garbage or or livestock food things like that I would totally concur with that, yes. Large brains need lots of protein. And the protein's got to come from meat. We're not talking, uh, you know, like some sort of wild beans or something like that. that no. Grows in the no, I don't think they're out there <laughs> cooking chunks of beans. No. Do you think they're primarily big animal hunters deer moose or small game like rodents raccoons rabbits etc well i think they're opportunistic they are you know I, I think they would prefer the the big game you know because that's going to uh, be a, a better source of uh, protein because there's more meat but i mean if you if uh, a small animal comes their way they're gonna um uh, they're gonna take advantage of it they absolutely will and we know that we know they, like any other predator. they would they will eat coyotes uh i think a lot of times they eat deer just because of the sheer number of deer and the availability um we know from talking to randy in canada they will kill a moose now there is more danger i would suppose to the you know to them doing that you know hunting a big animal uh, because you do run the risk of being injured and in nature an, uh, an injury can be a death sentence but you know the gain is quite a bit too but you're right yeah one thing we being talked a, about yeah, being opportunistic is what they are yeah very much but yes exactly and that kind of dovetails into this next comment and that is time and time and time and time again just talking about here in oregon in the cascades 
people that have simply vanished and what were they doing? It was a mushroom hunter and mushroom hunters are almost always quite often they're solo because they, they want to keep their, you know, their mushroom patch, you know, it's theirs, Secret. it's mine. I know where it is. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. And those guys, and we're talking professors from major universities, you know, people that are high profile that have just, poof, well, and if you think no about it, and I've, I've picked mushrooms before, you know, and um, we used to get chanterelles up in the area where I used to live, and um, your your attention is focused on the ground. You're not paying attention to what's around. In fact, we even got turned around a few ridges back, and uh, I had to, with a friend, I had to follow this creek down, a little tiny creek down, and um, that was something I taught as a young person, that if you followed the creeks down, you'd eventually find a road, and we did, and got back to my vehicle, but... Uh, it's a little unsettling because you're not paying attention. You know, I knew the area well, but I, I got turned around in there. So if you're not paying attention to your surroundings, you could be uh, grabbed pretty quickly by these things. And they know it. And they know well, it. Well, and look at, let's go back to Kurt, Kurt's very first experience. And Kurt was, the big was never on his radar screen. And he was picking chanterelles. He put his rifle on the ground. He picked a few of them, heard some strange whoops looked around i don't know what that is threw the chanterelles in his backpack did it again after the third time it screamed and did a lot of that jabber that we're talking about it was a um, yeah territorial display most likely yes and, and threw rocks at him so that was saying he, get uh, out yeah and he did smart guy <laughs> <laughs> yes that's that's why we're talking to kurt to this day uh, grabbed his rifle, his pack, and went home. So um, something about picking mushrooms that those guys vanish. Okay, I'm going to finish up here. looks like we're just about out of time. But Will, same guy, wants to know, any idea if they lose a lot of weight during the winter months every year? Has anybody noticed if uh, Bigfoot sighted in the winter often appear uh, skinny or starving? Well, what I've gotten in over the years seems to point that way. Um, we have areas where witnesses have told me in the spring, late spring especially, where they've seen the creatures, and they seem to be much thinner, almost emaciated looking at times. But it's not that's not constant. So at some places they're, they're feeding well, other areas they apparently aren't. And I suppose that depends on our level of experience too. And how many mushroom pickers are out in the wintertime? And I don't know. What are your thoughts on that, Forrest? What would you think? <laughs> okay, yes. We know what happens to professors picking mushrooms. Um, anyway, um, I think that, uh, of course, they would, uh, with the lack of availability of food during the wintertime, unless they're coming down to uh, lower elevations now, I don't have that problem because evidently we don't have, uh, you know, high elevations around here. So they just pretty much stay in the same area. And there's a constant source, whether it be wintertime or springtime or any time of the year uh, here of deer. So um, and livestock, too. And, and, you know, there's a lot of livestock that disappears that I'm sure that uh, ranchers aren't even aware of, too. So, um I would think that uh, during the winter time that they're going to, uh, you know, because of the coldness in your, particularly in your area, <clears throat> it's going to be more stressful on their body. So therefore, they're going to lose weight, and uh, then they're going to be thinner, uh, almost to an emaciated state come springtime. Now, one thing that I've always wondered about, and I have absolutely no knowledge of this. Do you wonder if they possibly have enough sense to store food? Well, at times... Have you ever heard of anything? You know? I, I was told that they do um, have caches. Oftentimes it's bones uh, for lean times. But they'll also fatten up, apparently, in the fall. That's why there's, you know, the, the highest time of activity for a Sasquatch is in the fall. And, right. And I've been told... <laughs> Uh, numerous times by locals in areas where there's salmon runs that the creatures will just go right to the water. There could be a hundred people standing there. They won't even pay attention to the people. They'll go right to the water, right to where the fish are and eat. So apparently they're fattening up before winters. 
especially in the northern colder yeah. regions. Yeah, well, bear do the same thing. I mean, exactly. you can go fishing and and have a grizzly 10 feet away from him that's not paying the slightest bit of attention to you. All he is focused on is that those salmon coming into that river. Yeah, so apparently they've learned to do that, um, you know, to better survive the harsher winters. You know, you talk about how interesting it is to get a good quality video of a Bigfoot. Honestly, I would love to film a group of people standing on the river when one of these things walks in and just starts grabbing <laughs> fish in front of them. Yeah, can you imagine the look on their faces? The look, the discussion, <laughs> the talk, yes. Oh, my gosh. Well, I guess... I don't know. Some of those fishermen are pretty uh, pretty focused on what they're doing. <laughs> That's true. That's true, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, I want to see one reach into. <laughs> I wanted to reach into the boat and steal the fisherman's fish. Well, it's probably happened. We just <laughs> haven't heard from anyone yet. <laughs> right. So. You may never right. have heard from the fisherman again. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and and who are they going to tell? Well, what happened to the big fish you caught? You know, you're always telling these big fish stories. I'm not going. I'm not going there. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think that's right. it for last the questions. Part, last part of this guy's same question. We're yeah. running out of time. What do you think of stories, some reported on the Bigfoot in History series, about the Bigfoot speaking with Indians, either with words or in one report, a Bigfoot spoke to an Indian hunter after he shot a juvenile Bigfoot saying, you shot my friend. I haven't heard that one, night, but I can... Okay, sure. Do you believe Bigfoot know Indian words or possibly even some English words now in some areas? You know, I, I think we should probably have Tom Seward back on to address that. He would he would be more knowledgeable, have better information. In fact, I'll, I'll contact him. We'll have him on the main Creek Devil episode where we can discuss that. So we'll we'll save that question for that particular time. Any final thoughts, Good. folks, before we wrap this up? Yes. I want to thank everybody for your questions. They're excellent questions. Not a bad question. We say this over and over again, but the only bad question is the one that you don't ask. So these are really good. They keep the topic. You, the audience, keep the topic alive. You keep it going. So please send in your questions to questions at creekdevil.com. Forrest, any final thoughts? No, great questions as usual. Always great questions, folks. And, and I hope you like the new format with the show. We've broken it up a little bit so, you know, you don't have to sit and wait, you know, for three hours. You, you get these particular portions on their own. So let us know what you think about that. So having said that, um, stay tuned for the midweek show on Thursday, folks. In Bigfoot history, near Ridgefield, Washington, early July 1963, Mr. and Mrs. Martin Henrich, Portland, fishing on Lewis River, saw what they assumed was a tree trunk near the bank suddenly walk into a thicket. It was beige in color and bigger than a human. Mrs. Henrich told her story to the Oregon Journal, and as a result, Jim Arian, son of Charles Arian, who had a farm nearby, went looking for tracks. He found 16-inch prints leading in and out of the river on the south bank near the railway bridge. I saw some of these when they were several weeks old and made a cast. The Chetco County, Oregon Monster. 1890, the Chetco Monster, sometimes called the Chetco Indian Devil. Location is about 60 miles north of Willow Creek, California, and approximately 6 miles north of the Cal, Oregon border. The mining operation was a small one, employing a dozen men whose families lived in tents alongside the river. For several weeks, nothing unusual happened. Occasionally, garbage cans were overturned at night by marauding bears. Sometimes the beasts were so troublesome that an armed guard stood by while the loggers felled the big trees. 
At the campsite, mothers watched their young children closely and forbade older boys and girls to play hide-and-seek in the forest. Even when they swam in the shallow river, an adult kept a sharp lookout for bears. Then, one morning, enormously large human footprints were discovered along the riverbanks. The loggers laughingly accused one another of having feet as big as chopping blocks. Everyone, from the oldest to the youngest in camp, measured his footprints against those of the unknown visitor. Since no one's feet were that large, one question was bandied about repeatedly. If those weren't a bear's tracks, whose were they? Someone said there was a wild man living way up the river. He was an irritable old devil who threatened to shoot anyone who approached his cabin. No matter how bad the weather was, he never wore a hat or boots. He was always bareheaded and barefooted. Barefooted? Then the tracks were his. With the mystery of the tracks happily solved, the people promptly forgot them. But several nights later, the sound of eerie whistling and angry shrieks wakened them. In every tent, men bounded out of bed and grabbed their guns, assuming there was a wounded bear nearby. No one lighted a lamp for fear of attracting the beast, and frightened children were warned not to cry. The spine-chilling noises went on and on. Sometimes they seemed close by, other times from the direction of the road or the river. But finally the sounds faded into the distance, and quiet returned to the dark campsite. At daybreak, the men gathered to talk. They debated whether it was a bear or mountain lion. To satisfy themselves and ease their family's worries, a half-dozen men searched about for bear or mountain lion tracks. They found no mountain lion spore at all and no fresh bear tracks. However, at the edge of the clearing, beyond the first stand of trees and dense undergrowth, they came upon more of the giant-sized human footprints. The men debated whether it was the old recluse. They agreed they had to catch the demented man before he killed someone. So, as quietly as possible, the search party backtracked along the line of footprints. These led them out to the road several hundred yards above the camp and up the road to the logging site. Here they found where the wild man had emerged from the forest into the open area and had prowled around tree stumps, piles of bushes, and the machinery used in loading the logs onto wagons. Then the men had a nasty shock. Massive, unwieldy tree limbs far too heavy for one man to handle, had been pulled out of the tangled waste piles and either tossed aside like matchsticks or used to beat on the machinery. The searchers followed the tracks back down the road into the forest. For the first time, they noticed shrubs torn to pieces and saplings uprooted and whacked to shreds. This explained the thudding and snapping sounds heard during the night. The footprints circled the camp, went down the well-beaten path to the river, turning back to the road, went down at a half mile and turned off into the forest. The men pressed on as far as they dared. However, when the tracks plunged down into a steep ravine, they stopped. The gloomy depths provided too many hiding places for a demented killer. The Chetco Indians believed there were man animals in the woods, the logger informed his friends. He had heard the story from a white man whom the Indians trusted enough to take into their confidence. They claimed that for generations they had shared their hunting grounds with fierce-looking hairy creatures that walked upright like men. The strange beings were not human nor animal, neither friendly nor hostile. They were simply there, like every other man or wild creature, so the Indians left them alone. But very late on the third night, the frightening sounds were once again heard faintly from off in the woods. People jerked upright in bed, As the whistling and screaming grew louder in every tent, men pulled on their trousers and boots and readied their guns. Obviously, the night howler was coming closer and closer. When he seemed only fifty feet away, one man took desperate action, hastily fashioning a torch of oily rags and kindling he set fire to it. Torch in one hand and rifle in the other, he raced into the woods. Meantime, the man's wife called for help. Within minutes, several men stumbled toward her in the darkness. They groaned when they learned that their comrade had gone into the woods alone. None hesitated to follow, but minutes passed while one dashed off to fetch a lantern and others supplied themselves with extra cartridges. Finally, the party headed into the forest in the direction from which the awful sounds were heard. They had covered only a short distance 
when the whistling and shrieking stopped. The men halted and listened. There was a long silence. Then an outburst of bestial yowling followed by human screams. Thinking their friend was being attacked, the men fought through the undergrowth, the man with the lantern in the lead. Moments later, their comrade appeared and collapsed in their arms. At first, he was too terrified to speak. His companions fired their guns to drive off the howler and then waited patiently for the poor man to gasp out the details. He said that by torchlight he had followed the line of giant-sized footprints and suddenly came upon a huge creature covered with hair. A bear? No, an ape, a monstrous ape, seven or eight feet tall, two axe handles wide across the shoulders. One axe handle measures 25 inches in length, equaling 50-inch wide shoulders or approximate. With beady yellow eyes and bared teeth, the torchlight must have blinded it because it stood stock still, one hand shading its eyes. Then it let out a tremendous roar. The man hurled his torch into its face, but instead of shooting at it, the frightened man ran screaming toward camp. While his companions did not doubt his word, they asked anxiously if he was sure the beast was an ape. Yes, he was positive. It really looked like an ape? Yes, an ape. Did it have fangs? You bet. Claws? The man said sarcastically that he hadn't stayed around long enough to study the brute. But after thinking it over, he said it had hands like a man, only twice as large, and covered with hair right down to the fingernails. After that, they all decided to return to camp. After much discussion, the loggers agreed to take turns standing guard day and night until the ape was captured or shot. Two men would patrol the campsite on two-hour watches while the rest worked or slept. Since women present knew how to handle a gun, their assistance during the daylight hours was welcomed. The older boys and girls offered to gather firewood so that large fires could be kept blazing all night. Nothing unusual happened during the day or the early night hours. But the two whose turn came about 2 a.m. asked the men they were to relieve to stand by. They wanted to slip into the woods and really search for the ape. Reluctantly, the one patrol agreed to stand by while their relief party set out on their ape hunt. The hunters carried a small lantern because without some light they could not follow any tracks. But they were careful to keep the light at ground level. Their rifles were loaded, and the safety catches thumbed back. Not long after, they came upon bits of charred cloth amidst a welter of huge footprints. This must be where their friend had thrown his torch. Yes. There were his boot marks. After examining the area closely, they found where the ape had turned deeper into the forest instead of backtracking to the road. They followed gingerly, step by step, over and around ferns, shrubs, outcroppings, and rocks, and massive tree trunks. What happened next could only be guessed. Apparently, the ape-like creature loomed before them. One man started shooting while the other put down the lantern and shot too. The patrol on guard at the campsite heard the volley of shots. They pounded each other happily. The hunters had killed the beast. But then they listened in mounting horror to frantic cries for help, which were drowned out by horrendous shrieks and roaring. The awful noises continued for some moments and then faded out. The silence was even more frightening to the guards. They shouted for help and soon were surrounded by armed loggers and their wives. After a hasty explanation, all the men plunged into the woods, leaving the women to build up the fires and protect the children. The searchers shouted, swung lanterns, and fired their guns so that their friends would know help was on the way. After advancing some distance, they stopped briefly and called to them. When neither responded, they fired shots. No answering shots were heard. Once more, the party advanced. Before long, they came upon a gruesome sight. Their friends were dead. Judging from bloodstains, their bodies had been slammed against tree trunks and torn to pieces. A trail of blood-smeared footprints led off into the forest. The beast obviously had been wounded, but no man present was willing to track it through the dark forest. Some did volunteer to gather up the remains of their unfortunate comrades, while others returned to camp for blankets and to break the sad news. Within 24 hours, the campsite was deserted. The logging operation was moved to another location. A professional hunter with trained hounds was hired to assist hunters in tracking down the savage beast. It was never captured, nor its voice ever heard again. The most people could hope for was that it had crawled into a well-hidden lair and died. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.